Okay, for this section, it is 3.2. And in this section, we're gonna be talking a lot about polynomials, okay? Um, specifically polynomials with a higher degree than two, because polynomials with the degree of two are quadratics. And um, we already know um, how to graph quadratics and all the different information about quadratics, okay? So um, in this uh, section, we're really just gonna be concentrating on the other kinds of polynomials, which have a higher exponent than two. So um, let's go ahead and get right into it. So a lot of information here until we get to the actual like problems where you're gonna do something, okay? Um, the practice section. So let me erase all the writing from the last video. Um, so it says, in this section, you will study basic features of the graph of polynomial functions. The first feature, and let me fix my focus so that it doesn't keep adjusting like that. Um, the first feature is that a polynomial graph is continuous. This means that as you draw it, you never have to pick up your pencil to draw the graph. Okay, you can draw it seam seamlessly. It has no breaks, no holes, no gaps in the image, okay? What I don't know is the direction that it's gonna come in from on the left. So like, is it gonna come in this way or is it gonna come in from the top going in, okay? And I don't know which way it's going to finish, nor do I know how many uh, hills and valleys I'm gonna have, okay? Um, you won't know that until you actually see the function and I give you some more information on how to decide that, okay? But the way it looks on the ends is called end behavior, okay? Um, and then depending on how many humps you have, that those are called turning points, okay? But your graphs will be something of this nature, okay? So um, keep in mind though that this is an example of a piecewise defined function and it is not continuous. Notice that you have not only a gap, but you also have a break in the graph. You have this graph and then this graph and you have a hole in the graph as well, okay? So this one is definitely not continuous. Now, uh, the second feature that you're going to realize is that the polynomial function is also smooth and has rounded turns. So it doesn't ever have sharp turns like this, okay? Um, they're very smooth and rounded. Everything just flows, okay? Um, it says a polynomial function cannot have a sharp turn. That's like the opposite of smooth, okay? For instance, the graph of the absolute value of x, this is not a, a polynomial function. It's not a smooth function. Notice there you've got a sharp turn instead of a smooth rounded turn, okay? Um, um, using the features presented in this section, coupled with your knowledge of plotting points, uh, finding intercepts, and symmetry, you should be able to make reasonably accurate sketches by hand, okay? Um, the polynomial functions that have the simplest graphs are what are called monomials, where it's just one term, okay? And it'll be x to some power, and you may or may not have an expo uh, coefficient in front of it, okay? Um, but your exponent does have to be a positive exponent. It has to be greater than zero. It needs to be an integer greater than zero. There, another way of saying an integer greater than zero is just a whole number. Okay, because the first whole number is one, not even a whole number. It's called a, um, yeah, because whole numbers start at zero. So you're talking about um, counting numbers. Counting numbers, you count starting at one, right? One, two, three, four, five. All of those are the kinds of exponents that you can have in a polynomial um, function, okay? So some more inferences that we're gonna make about, or some more observations that we're gonna make about these polynomials, okay? Um, notice that in this figure, you can see that when your exponent is even, like look at x squared, it's in gray, this parabola in gray, and then look at x to the fourth. It's this sort of parabola looking image, 
in black. Notice that it's a little bit flatter and wider around the origin, okay? Same thing to this one. Um, notice that when you have X cubed in gray there, and then you have X to the fifth in black, notice it's pretty much the same image. It's just a little more flatter around the origin, okay? Another thing that we will notice is that when your exponent is even, the graph touches the X axis at the X intercept. Whereas if when your exponent is odd, the graph crosses the X axis at the X intercept. So here's my X intercept. Notice that there, it just touches it and then comes right back off. Whereas here, it actually goes through it and on the other side, okay? So that's going to be a key determining factor on being able to tell the behavior at a specific x-intercept. Uh, another word they use for x-intercept is zero, okay? So if they're gonna, the exponent describes the behavior at these zeros, okay? And we'll summarize that in a little bit, okay? Um, so here it's an example, it says, sketch the graph of each function, um, f of x equals negative x to the fifth. Um, notice that negative x to the fifth is odd exponent. So it's going to be similar to the x cubed function, which looks like this. But we know that it has a negative coefficient, so it's actually going to reflect it over the x axis. So then that means that the graph is actually going to go downward on this side and upward on that side. And then because the exponent is higher than a cube, it should be a little bit more flat around the origin, okay? And so it does have this image over here. Now for B though, B is an X to the fourth, okay? So it's gonna look a lot like X squared, but it's gonna be flatter because the exponent is bigger than a square. So it's gonna be flatter around the X intercept, but then you have this plus one inside of there. So what that does is it shifts it to the left uh, one unit. And so that's why the graph looks like this now. It's like more flat um, parabola, but shifted over one unit, okay? Now, in example one, note that both the graphs eventually rise or fall without bound as X moves to the left or to the right, okay? So that was what I mentioned at the beginning. You don't know whether the graph is going to be coming in from up high on the left or if it's going to be coming in down low on the left. And then after all of your turns and all of that, is it going to end up going up high or is it going to go down low? Okay. Um, we won't know unless we find out some more information. Okay. And so one of the bits of information that helps us decide that is the leading coefficient test. And what the leading coefficient test tells us is the end behavior. So it tells us if the ends are going, you know, down in one direction, up in the other direction, or if they're the reverse, or if both are going up, or if both are going down. Okay. Um, but the person or the term that tells us all of that information is going to be the leading coefficient. Um, the leading term, really, not just the coefficient. Okay. So it really shouldn't be called the leading coefficient test. It should be called the leading term test, okay? And so what you do is once your function is in descending order, you're gonna take that term that has the highest exponent and that's the one you're going to look at, okay? Now, here's how it breaks down. If you're looking at this leading term, if this exponent is odd, then you know that it's going to have this end behavior, okay? Or this end behavior. Essentially, one is gonna go up and one is gonna go down, okay? However, I won't know unless I know what the coefficient is doing. If that coefficient is positive, then I know it will go down on the left and up on the right. If that coefficient, though, is negative, then it'll do the reverse. It'll go up on the left and down on the right. Now, what it does in the middle, we don't know, which is why you see those little dotted lines, because they don't know, one, they don't know what the function is, and two, they don't 
know how many turning points or curves or zeros or any of that information. We don't have that information, okay? All we know from the leading term is what the end will look like, okay? Similarly, when the n is even, so you have this leading term, and when that exponent is even, the uh, ends are either gonna both be going up or both be going down, okay? If your coefficient is positive, they will go up kind of like a parabola, right? And if your coefficient is negative, then they'll open downward, like a downward parabola, okay? Um, so the best way that I ex describe this, like when I make notes for myself, is I say if I have a positive x to the even, I know it kind of looks like x squared on the end, so it will go up and up, okay? And I shouldn't even put the, the bars because I don't know where on the graph it's going up and up. It could be all on the right-hand side or on the left-hand side, so maybe not necessarily in the center. So I just know that the ends will do this. Now, if I have a negative x to the even, that's like a downward parabola. So I know the ends will go downward. Now, if I have a positive but an x to the odd, I know that that has end behavior like an x cubed. So it will go down on the left, but up on the right. And if I have a negative coefficient, but an odd exponent, then I know that it does the reverse of this one and it'll go up on the left and down on the right, okay? And as long as you remember these in behaviors, um, you should be able to apply the leading term test. Okay. So it says describe the right hand and left hand behavior for each function. So this is already in descending order. This is the guy with the highest exponent and it is a negative x to the odd, okay? Because of that, it's going to have this in behavior. What is it doing? It rises to the left, but it falls to the right. Okay. Um, and that's essentially what we're going to be doing to finding these solutions. So um, notice the responses here. So the first graph, 2a, was this function. And you don't have to necessarily draw it at all, okay? All you needed to do was examine this first leading term, and then notice that I got the same thing. Rises to the left, falls to the right, okay? Similarly, when I took the second one, if you take this function, it's already in descending order. If I examine the first, the leading term, that's a positive coefficient with an even exponent. And those are supposed to look like positive parabolas on the ends, okay? Again, I don't know what's happening in the middle. All I know is that the ends are both gonna be going up, which is in fact what it's doing, okay? And then how do you write that in words? That means it rises to the left and to the right. Okay, so it rises in both directions. Now for part C, it was this function. Again, this is in descending order. So if we look at the highest exponent term, that's a positive x to the odd. So that's supposed to look like an x cubed function on the ends. I don't know what's happening in the middle, okay? And that's exactly what the graph looks like. And how do you describe this? This one actually falls to the left and rises to the right. Okay, so again, not leading coefficient, but leading term, because you're not just looking at the coefficient, you're looking at the coefficient and its exponent. So you're essentially looking at the whole term. Um, in example two, notice that the leading coefficient tells you whether the graph eventually rises to the right or to the left, okay? Other characteristics such as the intercepts, the maximum and minimum points, those peaks and valleys, okay, um, must be determined by other kinds of tests. So here's what we know about the x-intercepts, okay? It can be shown that for a polynomial of degree n, the following statements are true. If the polynomial has a highest exponent of n, that's how many real zeros you're gonna have. At most, you can have less than that, it's just at most you will have that number. So if you have like, let's say an x to the third power uh, polynomial, and x to the third is the highest exponent in the whole polynomial, 
there's no way that you could have five intercepts on an x to the third polynomial. The only kind of intercepts you're going to have are three, two, one, or none. That's it. It's three or less. Okay. Um, also, the exponent tells you the number of turning points. So again, if I have some, let's say x cubed plus 3x squared minus 7x minus 5, I just made something up, okay? Let's pretend that's my function, okay? That means it's going to have uh, three x-intercepts at most. What does that mean? That means it could have three or two or one or none, okay? But three at the most. So that's fact one. Fact two tells me that I'm going to have three minus one, which equals two turning points. So I can already give you a sketch pretty much. Okay. Not yet though, but almost, we're almost there. Okay. Um, turning points are called the maximum and minimum. Those are the peaks of the valleys. Okay. So, so far with what I know, I can tell you that the end behavior is going to go down on the left and up on the right. Okay. I also know that it's going to turn and then turn again to come back up. I know I'm going to have two turning points, okay? At most, I could have less than two. I can have two or one or none, okay? I could just be going straight through there, okay? Or I don't think I could do one because if I do one turning point, aren't I going downward? So it would either have to be uh, no turning points, it's just going straight, or it would have to be two turning points in order for me to end up back up here, okay? What I don't know is what's going on at the intercepts. Um, I don't know where the x-intercepts are, which I can find algebraically, but also I don't know if I'm gonna go through the x-intercepts or just touch the x-intercepts and then keep going, okay? So there's some more information that I need to know in order to complete the graph of, let's say, a function like this, okay? So um, these are some statements that we have to get used to. They are all the same statements, okay? So this number is a zero of the function is the same thing as saying that this number is a solution when you set the function equal to zero. So that right there tells me how to find my x-intercepts. My x-intercepts are found by taking the function equaling it to zero and then I will get an x-intercept, okay? And why is it an x-intercept? Because this guy right here is a factor of the polynomial. And when you set each factor equal to zero, don't you get x equals to a as your solution? So x equals to a is your zero. And so then we know that a is your x-intercept. So you've got to get a handle on the fact that those four statements are literally the same thing, okay? You have to start training your brain to saying zeros are x-intercepts. Zeros are solutions to when I set my function equal to zero. And all the factors that I set equal to zero for my function are what give me those solutions, right? That's the only way we know how to um, solve polynomial equations is by factoring. Okay. So here they give me an example and they say, here's a function and find all the zeros, okay? Then determine the maximum possible number of turning points. Um, so the possible turning points is real easy to do, right? You just take this highest exponent and four minus one means three max turning points. That part you could do so quickly, okay? But the finding the inner, the real zeros part, that's not very, very easy. You have to do it, you have to set the function equal to zero. So all of this stuff equal to zero. And then you solve. Well, in order for me to solve that, I have to factor it. So I noticed that it had a negative in front, so I have to factor out the negative. They have a two in common, and they have an x squared in common. So when I factor the negative two x squared out, we end up with a positive x squared and a negative one. And if you're not sure if you factored it correctly, always distribute this. Negative 2x squared times x squared is negative 2x to the fourth. Negative 2x squared times a negative 1 is a positive 2x squared. So that is factored completely or factored correctly. Once you have it factored, um, you want to examine this. So like uh, this can be factored some more. 
we get x minus one and x plus one. And then once you have it all completely factored, you can set each one of these equal to zero. If you set this equal to zero, you will divide by negative two and you'll get rid of the negative two, but zero divided by negative two is still zero. And then if I take the square root on both sides, I get x equals plus or minus the square root of zero, but that just means x equals zero, okay? And if I set x minus one equal to zero, you're just gonna add one over and get x equals one. And then if I set the third factor equal to zero, I'm gonna minus one over and I get the fact the, I get the solution x equals negative one. Um, and so this is just saying the same thing that I did. It was a fourth degree polynomial. So it'll have four minus one, which is three turning points. Um, but that's pretty much it for that first example. Okay, now they wanna mention something, okay? Because remember we did this problem, right? And we set this guy equal to zero. And when we did that, we got x squared equals zero. And when I took the square root, I got x equals plus or minus the square root of zero, which is plus or minus zero. So there's really two answers here. There's x equals positive zero and negative zero. It just happens to be the same number, okay? Um, but there are two answers there. That is what is called a repeated zero. So it's a solution that we get, but we get it twice, okay? Um, so anytime you have a factor that has an exponent, that exponent is gonna tell you how many times that solution repeats. So in the case of negative two x squared, that can be written as x minus zero squared, okay? And if it is written like that, notice that when I set this factor equal to zero, I get the value zero, right, this value. But because of the exponent, I know that it has a multiplicity of two, okay? And so that's why it repeats twice. Um, Now here's another good thing that's, it's really good. We learned about the even, right? If the exponent was even, then we knew that the graph touched the x-axis, but it did not cross, right? But what's interesting is when it crosses, okay? When the multiplicity is one, it crosses straight through, okay? But when the multiplicity is three or higher, it actually wiggles through. And the best example I can give you is like, looking at y equals x, y equals x squared, and y equals x cubed, okay? Now, you know that you have the um, origin is your x-intercept on all of these, okay? But for this one, it's a straight line. Notice that the exponent there, which is called the multiplicity, is one, and it goes straight through that x-intercept. Whereas here, the exponent or the multiplicity is even. And so in this case, the parabola just touches the x-intercept. It doesn't actually cross through it. And then over here for the x to the cube, we know that that graph looks like this. This is called a wiggle, where it like changes the direction it's going in. It is going through, but it's changing the curvature in which it goes through there. This one does not change in curvature, it just goes straight. But this one's going like, like downward almost if you were to continue it. But as soon as it hits this point, it starts going upward. When you get to Cal 1, they talk about that. It's called concavity, okay? And concave um, up means that it looks like a cup. And concave down means it looks like an upside down cup, okay? And so this section has concave downward. If I were to continue it, it would look like this. Whereas this section has concave upward. And if I were to continue it over here, it would look like the parabola and be upward, okay? Cubes and higher odd exponents change their concavity throughout the graph. X squareds do not change their concavity. They're either gonna be all up or all down. And then X definitely does not change concavity. It doesn't even have any, it's just straight. Okay, so again, that's not till you get to Cal 1, but it will come back um, the way that the graph curves, okay? 
Um, but the biggest thing is to remember that it'll either cross, touch, or wiggle through your um, x-intercepts. So it says a polynomial is considered in standard form when it's written in descending order and the exponents go from left to right, okay? So uh, before the leading coefficient test or leading term test, Um, it is a good idea to check that the polynomial is in its standard form because you're supposed to only be looking at the term with the highest exponent, okay? Um, now, they kind of cut into something different. It's a whole different idea. Um, but it is going to help us a little bit, okay? So, and then I'll explain later when it's going to help us. But... They're going to talk about this intermediate value theorem, okay? And I'm going to try to explain it. I put the graph in there to help explain it. But if you have two x values and you go and you plug those x values into your function and you find their y values, if those y values are not equivalent, okay, that means that one y value is smaller than the other y value. It could be the other way around. You could have the graph going in this direction, right? It could look like anything, okay? The point is, is that if they're not equivalent, then one is bigger than the other, okay? And if that's the case, then there's got to be some kind of y value in between. If they're bigger than each other, one is bigger than the other, there's gotta be a y value in between them. And if there's a y value in between them, there's gotta be an x value that's attached to that y value, okay? Or that gives you that y value. So that's what the intermediate value theorem is saying. It says, if those guys are not equal, then um, any number, any y value between those two values must have an x value C between A and B, where the x value yields this as the y value, okay? Um, and so it says, let A and B be real numbers such that A is less than B. And then if B is a polynomial such that the y values are not equivalent, then somewhere in that interval, you're going to have other y values, another y value between f of a and f of b. Um, the intermediate value theorem helps you locate the real zeros of a polynomial in the following way. So if you can find an x value a for which the polynomial is positive and another x value b for which it is negative, then you can conclude that the function has at least one zero between these two values. Why is that? Because, think about that. If I take the same image, and you have A, and you have B, and you tell me that when you plug in A, you get a positive value. But when you plug in B, you get a negative value. Well, at some point in some way, I'm going to have to go through there in order to connect the two. And we know that with polynomials, everything's all connected and smooth. So if I have to cross through there at some point, then there's some guy in here, C, that is an x-intercept, okay? And it makes sense because between these two y values, between a positive y value and a negative y value, don't you have a zero y value? And there has to be somebody assigned that gives you that zero y value. That's this x value, C. Okay, um, so it says, for example, let's look at the function x cubed plus x squared plus one. When x is equal to negative two, we get the y value of negative three, which is negative. But when we plug in x equal to negative one, we get the y value of a positive one. That tells me that somewhere between negative two and negative one is a x-intercept, okay? Um, and you can continue this line of reasoning and you can apply, approximate any real zeros of a polynomial to any desired accuracy. This concept is further demonstrated in example four. So they took this same function. Oh, it looks like they changed it a little bit. Yeah, they changed it a little bit. I don't know why they changed it a little bit. But they took this graph, okay? And they found a couple of function values. So they just randomly plugged in some numbers and then tried to find where the graph started, went from negative to positive or from positive to negative. 
And so if you look at all these corresponding y values, it looks like something's happening in between here because it did go from negative to positive, which means that somewhere in between here, there's an x-intercept, okay? So what they did is, is they tried to go a little bit further. So if I take my number line and I say, here's negative one and here's zero, these are x values. I wanna take a number here and it looks like they took another number there. And the number they took here was negative 0 0.8 and the number they took here was negative 0 0.7. And they noticed that even when they took these values, okay, notice that one of them gave you a negative and the other one gave you a positive. So now you know that your x-intercept is somewhere in between these two guys, okay? And if you keep going in that fashion, um, you can eventually approximate that zero um, a little bit better, okay? You could keep getting more and more accurate. For instance, um, I could take negative 0 0.75 and negative 0 0.7. Or let's just see what negative 0 0.75 is. That would be... Negative 0 0.75 cubed minus negative 0 0.75 squared. Oops, I'm all in the exponent. And then plus one. And I get a positive. So here I am. Here's negative one, here's zero. Here's negative 0 0.8, which we know had a negative y value. And then here I am with negative 0 0.75 and still a positive value. So I'm gonna get even closer. I'm gonna do negative 0 0.79. Let's see if that will get me to the positives. Oh, that might make a difference. Second insert negative. No, I didn't change it. But let me go change this to 0.9. Oh, and this one gave me a negative. So if I do negative, that one right there is negative 0 0.79, um, I can get it even closer. So let me zoom in. Okay, so here's negative 0 0.75, which I knew was a positive. And now you have negative 0 0.79, and that gave you a negative. So I need to get closer still so I could still figure out like the accuracy of this x-intercept, okay? But right now, all we know is it's somewhere between these values. So let's try to plug in something in the middle, like um, point, negative 0 0.77, and see if that's positive or negative. And that's negative. So now I have 0 0.77 and I'm still negative. So let's try something in between like negative 0 0.76. But you see what we mean by you can, you can start narrowing in on finding that answer. So now negative 0 0.76 has a negative. So I know it's somewhere in between these two numbers. And now that I'm at 0.76 and 0.75, I'm probably gonna have to start trying 0.765, right? Or no, actually 0.755, okay? So if I go here and I try negative 0.755. And you don't have to do this, but if you wanna get more accurate, see that's a negative as well. So it's somewhere now in between um, negative 7.55 and negative 7.50. But that's what I mean by you can keep repeating the process until you get closer and closer and closer to that actual zero, okay? Um, and you can appropriate to the, the closest accuracy if you want. For graphing purposes, if I'm going to I think a decimal, one decimal is good enough. As soon as you know, like it's between 0.7 and 0.8, you're, 
you can pretty much draw that and they all look the same on the graph, okay? Now, what do we do in this section, right? What are the homework problems going to look like, okay? So this one says to graph the polynomial. That's all it says, okay? So I am going to need to be able to give them some information. Now for me, I'm going to change this to decimals. What is nine divided by five? 1.8. And so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to try to factor this. Um, and it looks like I have fifths. So I'm gonna try to factor out the fifth just to get it out of the way. So let's do one fifth, and they have an X in common. So then X to the fourth, and then negative two divided by one fifth. Let's see, negative two divided by one fifth is negative 10. And then if I'm taking out an X, I will have X squared, and then plus nine, and there won't be no more X. Okay, so again, if you're not sure if you factored it correctly, make sure you distribute. X times X is X to the fifth. One fifth times one is one fifth. Then X times X squared is X cubed. One fifth times a negative 10 is negative two. And then X times no X's is going to be an X. And one fifth times nine is nine fifths. So this is factored correctly. Now I can factor that even more by saying x squared and x squared, but I don't think there's any factors that will add to give me nine that will subtract to give me 10. Oh, maybe, maybe minus one and minus 10, right? Or they'll multiply to give me a positive nine. So that means this would have to be nine. So negative times a negative will give me positive nine, but when I add them, I do get negative 10. But then these are two, the difference of two squares. So this is X minus one and X plus one, and that one is X minus three and X plus three, okay? So this is what we need to do. We are going to write the multiplicities up here, and then we're gonna write the zeros. So the zeros here, when I set this factor equal to zero, I'm gonna get one and it has multiplicity of one. Then this zero is gonna have, if I set this equal to zero, I'll have to minus the one. So I'll get negative one with multiplicity of one. Here, and I set this equal to zero, I will get three and this one has multiplicity of one. And then if I set this factor equal to zero, I'll have to minus three over and I get negative three. And that will have a multiplicity of one. So what does that mean? That means that the graph crosses through X intercepts one, negative one, three, and negative three. Okay, so that helps me. If I were to draw this, okay, I know that at one, negative one, three, and negative three, I have these x-intercepts. I also know um, the end behavior and the number of turning points, okay? So if you look at the original, it is in descending order. It goes from exponent five, three to one. And so if I look at this guy, this guy tells me the end behavior and it tells me the turning points. Okay, it tells me the number of turning points. So if I take this exponent and I subtract one, I get four maximum turning points. I could only have two turning points, but I will have at max four turning points. The end behavior, notice that this is a positive and the exponent is an odd, which means it looks like an X cube on the ends. So I know that my graph is gonna go 
up on this side and down on that side, okay? I also know that I have to go through this x-intercept, okay? And because I have to go through this one, at some point I'm gonna come back down. I also know that somewhere I'm gonna have to turn around because I gotta go back up through that one. And then at some point I'm gonna turn around because I'm gonna have to go um, back through this one. Hmm. I lost a value. Oh, I see what happened. Look at my little X right there. And I forgot to write my little X right here. That is gonna make a huge difference, okay? And I'll explain why right now. That X can be written as X minus zero. And then therefore it has a little one multiplicity two. So my zeros, I actually have one, two, three, four, five of them. I have zero with multiplicity of one. So I have another x-intercept right here. Now that makes sense because when I was doing this stuff, I'm like, I have to cross, 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 but then I got to cross again. And that doesn't make sense because it's supposed to be going up, right? So everything has to match, everything. In behavior, I know is that way for a fact, okay? So I'm not going to change that part of my graph. But now that I remember, or I realize that I have another x-intercept here, that might affect things, okay? So let's see. I'm going to have to like turn and go through there, then turn somewhere here and go through there, turn somewhere here, go through there, turn somewhere down here and go through there. And then that will land me the way it's supposed to end up, okay? What I don't have enough information about is how high up is this going before it turns around, okay? And so for that, I do have to come up with a chart. Just to get an idea of how high up or how low it's going, okay? So I noticed that between these two X values, I have this X value negative two. Between these two, I can try negative 0.5. Between these two, I can try 0.5. And then between these two, I can try positive two. And so I'm gonna plug each of these numbers into my function. Now it's easier to use, um, so I'm gonna plug each of these X's into this function and it's easier to use the programming capability to do that. So I'm gonna do the first X value negative two store is x and then i'm going to plug this function in. x raised to the fifth get down minus two x raised to the third get down plus nine fifths x and when i hit enter it's going to plug in negative two for me and i get six now i'm going to do negative 0 0.5 store is x and so now when I do negative 0 0.05 stores x, I'm going to go back up to the top and copy that same function and hit enter to plug in negative 0 0.5. I get about negative 0 0.7. Now I'm going to plug in 0.5 store is x. And I'm going to go back up and highlight that function and then hit enter to plug it in. Again, I get about positive 0 0.7. And then finally, I'm going to plug in positive two and I get negative six. So this really does help me because now I know, I don't know, let me do one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. So now I know that I have negative two and six. So I know it goes way up high. I have negative um, 0.5 and negative 0.7, so it's about right there. I have positive 0.5 and positive 0.7, and then I have two and negative six. And so now I can see where the graph is going, okay? You can see that it's going up to here. So it might be at a different angle there. It might just be going downward like that. 
then I'm going to go cover to this spot, to that spot, to this spot, and then through there. Okay. And so then this is the sketch of this graph. But I had to put a lot of information together to get it. Okay. I had to figure out the end behavior, the turning points. I had to factor the whole darn thing to get me the zeros with the multiplicity so I knew whether the graph was going to go through or just touch the x-intercepts. And then I even needed some extra information um, in between the x-intercepts so that I could know how high or how low the graph was going to go. Okay. So for practice two, it says describe the left-hand and right-hand behavior of the graph of this polynomial function. It is in descending order already. So you take the term that has the highest exponent and that has the negative number in front, but an odd exponent. So that is not quite like the x cubed, it's the reverse, okay? So it's actually gonna go down here and up there. So this one will rise, rises to the left and falls to the right. So it's going up on the left and falling to the right. This one is not the correct one. This is for a positive x to the odd, okay? But we have a negative x with an odd exponent. Okay, now number three has this one and it says consider this function t squared times 3t minus 10 plus 7. It says find all the zeros of the polynomial. Now, I don't think that I can factor that though. AC method, if I do three times seven, I get 21. Um, one times 21, three times seven. Oh yeah, you can get 10 if I do negative and negative. So this can factor. These two have a three T in common, so I get T minus one. I have to bring down the middle sign. These have a seven in common, so I have t minus one. Um, that's t squared, that's negative three t, that's negative seven t, and that's positive seven. So I did factor it correctly. Then I'm factoring out the common t minus one, and I'm left over with the three t minus seven. So this actually factors into t minus zero squared, right? When it's just t by itself, it can be written as t minus zero t minus one and three t minus seven, okay? So the first thing I did was put it in its factored form. I also wanna have it in its standard form. You do need both, okay? Um, you have to have both in order for you to have, get everything you need from the graph. So not only did I need to have it in its factored form, I also want to have it in its standard form. And that's where everything's all multiplied out, all the like terms have been combined, all of that good stuff. So this is almost in that form. I just need to distribute the t squared. So this becomes um, 3t to the fourth minus 10t cubed plus 7t squared. Okay, so I have it in its factored form and I have it in its standard form. To get the zeros, I'm going to use the factored form. So for all the zeros, I'm gonna set this factor equal to zero. I'm gonna set this factor equal to zero and I'm going to set this factor equal to zero. Okay, and when I do that, I get t equals zero. Here I get t equals one. And here I get t equals seven over three, okay? So these are my zeros for part A. Now for part B, it says determine whether the multiplicity of each zero is even or odd. So for zero, notice that it has a two up there that has even multiplicity. For one, notice that it has like an invisible one exponent. So this has odd multiplicity. 
And then for the number 7 thirds, that came from this factor, which also has an exponent of 1. And so this one also has odd multiplicity. That's all they wanted for part B, is just to know the, uh, the kind of multiplicity for each zero. Now for part C, it says determine the maximum number of turning points. So for in behavior and turning points, you do have to look at the standard form, okay? And if I'm looking at the standard form, all I'm going to be poking out at is this 3t to the fourth. That's it. This is the leading term. Okay, if it asked me for end behavior, I'm just going to add this in here, end behavior, because normally I need that too. If it asked me for end behavior, that's a positive x to the even, which means the end behavior would look like this. And that means it rises to the left and to the right. It rises on both directions, right? Now, for the turning points, though, I'm going to take that exponent and I'm going to subtract one. And so I get three turning points. And so three is all they wanted there, OK? Um, but again, if they had asked me this in behavior, I do still have to look at that same leading term. So the x-intercepts and the multiplicities you get from the factored form, and then the turning points and the end behavior you get from the standard form. So it is very much helpful to know both, okay? So let's go ahead and look at number four. So number four says, find a polynomial function with least degree possible, a leading coefficient of one and the given zeros. Now, this is helpful to know. If you're talking about the factored form, okay, every polynomial function will have a leading coefficient and then it'll have x minus um, the first x-intercept with some kind of multiplicity. Then it'll have x minus another x-intercept with its own multiplicity. And give me one. Okay, and, um, and if we have a third one, it would have its own multiplicity and so on and so forth, depending on how many zeros you have, okay? where C1, C2, C3 are zeros. And A is the leading coefficient. Okay. So um, if we have this basically, since they gave us the leading coefficient, um, I'm going to use different colors. So they gave us the fact that we had a leading coefficient of one, which means that a equals one. They also tell me that I have zeros of this guy. So I now know that my zeros are zero, one, and four. Okay. So how is that going to look in our function? It's going to be f of x equals a, which is one, and then it's going to be x minus the first zero x minus the second zero, and x minus the third zero. And if you had any negative zeros, of course, the double negatives would turn to plus, right? So what does that look like? We have one, x minus zero is one. This is still x minus one. This is still x minus four, okay? Um, one times x is x. And then if I need to start multiplying, I'm gonna distribute my x first. I get x squared minus x. And then I have to FOIL this up. So I end up with, um, actually I end up with x to the third 
minus 4x squared minus x squared plus 4x. And so I end up with x cubed minus 5x squared plus 4x. And this is the polynomial that they were looking for. Okay. So we do need to know how to write the factored form because that is um, essentially all the information that they gave us for was for the factored form. And then once we multiply everything out, this is now the standard form. Okay. So that concludes this section, um, 3.2.